Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for making the effort to turn up today. It's uh, very special, very important for, for me and for the museum. And what I'd like to do is just start by the very roots of where this unsung hero of the 20th century um, really started from in terms of lineage. And we need to go back to medieval France, uh, around the 12th century, to be precise. So if you continue to, to look at this map, you'll see that um, Rashi was from um, Troy. Now, some people will say that he, he may have, in fact, originated in Worms in Germany, but uh, Troy is, in fact, where he, he originally came from. As you know, he was involved um, with the Talmud and the interpretation in many ways. Um, Rashi did quite a bit of work on that in that time, very important. That's the first link that I'd like you to reflect on. Then we need to jump to Prague and the Czech Republic in the 16th century, where we need to think of some interesting myths, particularly one called the Golem, which some of you may or may not be aware of, or the Golem. But interesting that the Maharal, or uh, better known as Rabbi Lo, who would have been at the time a very significant uh, person uh, in that period, the significance of this, would you believe, is that there is a direct lineage with Viktor Frankl's mother. So Elsa Frankel is a descendant of Rashi and is a descendant, would you believe, of Rabbi Lo. So Viktor Frankl himself is, from looking at various uh, family documents growing up, put this together, and it is of significance when you think you can go back to, to the 12th century. His parents met and they married and they lived in Prague, that beautiful city, and their names were Elsa and Gabriel. They married in 1901. And they had three children, Victor, Walter, and Stella. Uh, the only remaining one after the Holocaust was Stella, sadly. His father was an interesting character as well, so while we've talked about his mother, his father was what they called a Zadik, a just man. Yom Kippur was always honored. To God's will, I hold still, was one of his famous phrases. Victor himself grew up in 6 Cern Street, Vienna. That was his birthplace. And this was where he originally started to contemplate and think about death. And what was important to him and what troubled him was, did death completely eradicate one's meaning in life? And this was something that he thought about and he thought about for most of his life. So in terms of the trans transitoriness of life itself, it began to form what he eventually called his ontology of time. But in terms of how he viewed the past, the present and the future, very significant part of his theory and his therapy. But the conclusion he came to was that it's death itself that makes life meaningful. And this became one of the key pillars in his overall thinking. For those of you that know the theory and therapy around the mental disorders, obviously in Vienna at that time, the 20s, was a very significant uh, part of the world for psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. And Sigmund Freud was obviously an extremely popular but also significant figure at the time. Alfred Adler with individual psychology was also a very significant figure, but they were two competing schools. In terms of Viktor Frankl, he had variables with psychoanalysis, but expulsion from individual psychology. So while he had differences with Freud, even though he respected him highly, he did get influenced significantly by Adler and moved away from psychoanalysis into individual psychology. But when he got interested in anthropology, things didn't go so well, and Alfred Adler actually expelled him from individual psychology, so it was quite a significant step. What Frankel wrestled with most in terms of 
logotherapy and its position within psychoanalysis and individual psychology was, as I've said here. It was the border area that lies between psychotherapy and philosophy, with special attention to the problems of meaning and values within psychology. That's what he wrestled with most. He felt that there was a dimension missing that psychoanalysis and psychotherapy didn't take into consideration the wholeness of the human being, where the humanness of the human being resides. And this was something that he was constantly challenging himself with and couldn't quite work it out until it began to form. As he was growing up in Vienna, he suddenly found himself being drawn to being a physician, the medical side of things, he had a deep interest in psychiatry. I think it was a phrase that Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, had said about don't be ashamed of becoming your true self that a friend said to him once. So he tended to follow this with great vigor and great enthusiasm. And in terms of what he had understood about the Talmud in his earlier days and his, his own historical thinking, he felt that this could also be a way to, to honor what his teachings had told him, where he who saves but one soul is to be regarded as one who has saved the whole world. So he followed this into the psychiatric dimension, as he calls it, with a view to exploring where the humanness of the human being resides. Don't despair at wanting to become your authentic self, was what was said to him. And that was significant, as I mentioned earlier, a famous Kierkegaard phrase. So there were three schools at the time in Vienna. Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, as I said, Alfred Adler's individual psychology, and then what was known as the third Viennese school of psychotherapy, interestingly enough at the time, which was logotherapy and existential analysis with Viktor Frankl. There were a number of things that he wanted to, <coughs> to get out there, to disseminate. One was the primary motiv motivation to do this work has been my effort to overcome the psychologism in the field of psychotherapy, where it usually coexists with a pathologism. These were very important thoughts for Franco. And this is a quote. But both are aspects of a more comprehensive phenomenon, namely reductionism, which also includes sociologism and biologism. So basically, Frankl had a problem with anything ism. Once something became an ism, he had an immediate problem with it, because it was trying to make a unidimensional world from really a multidimensional world, from a plural world. And this was something that he decided he was going to strive to combat for the sake of everybody. Reductionism is today's nihilism, he felt as it reduces a human being by no less than an entire dimension, namely the specific human dimension. It projects what is uniquely human from the three-dimensional domain of the total human being to the two-dimensional plane of the subhuman. In other words, reductionism to him was subhumanism. And Frankl's thinking behind all of this was, can we always infer from a shadow what casts it. And if we think about it, we probably can't. But we tend to see the shadow. We tend to see the one or two dimensions and never think about the perspective from the third. This became the beginning of his tri-dimensional ontology, which was really at the core of Frankl's thinking and of his work. One thing that upset him was, in terms of reductionism, was this whole sense of nothingness. So in terms of the transitionness of life, that was one thing. But in terms of the reductionism and the subhumanism, it was what people were saying in terms of, you are nothing but, or we are nothing but. And this caused him a problem until he thought about, well, maybe it's no thing. So if you put a hyphen between no and thing, we certainly are not things. Things determine themselves. We are self-determining, would have been a key message. In, in fact, quite a lot of Heidegger would have been of influence to, to Frankel around that time as well, in terms of 
being and things, where Heidegger really felt that being is not one of many things. So by no, certainly not being a thing and being self-determining, this began his thinking around the core areas of freedom and responsibility. And freedom and responsibility became key pillars to his overall thinking. So Vienna, 1929, was where logotherapy was born and where he started to practice. And it was back in 1929, which I believe, that he began to formulate his three groups of values. And these were values that he felt would allow people to discover meaning in life, because he really felt and was never tired of saying meaning cannot be prescribed. It cannot be given. It must be discovered. And it's up to every individual to discover it for themselves. And as logotherapists, it's not that we can provide you with your meaning in your life, but it's really a case of letting you know that there's unconditional meaning there, but it's your journey. So those three values were, or the three possibilities to give and find meaning, whether it be in livelihood or life, is a deed we do in a work we create, a creative value. The second was in what we experience from the world, experiential values, either in truth, in beauty, in art, in culture, but it's what we take from existence. So experiential values were the second group. And the third group then was where, through an unchangeable fate that we have no choice about, were attitudinal values. And to Frankel, attitudinal values were the higher group of values that you can get. Not in terms of a value judgment, but in terms of including the lower dimensions, but transcending them. So in terms of freedom and responsibility, a very important message would be, while we will never be free from conditions in life, from the finiteness of ourselves, of our biology, we will always be free to choose an attitude towards it. We will always be free. There'll be a residue of freedom to take a stand towards that blow of fate, whether it be an incurable disease or human suffering of a different kind. That residue of freedom exists in every single one of us. It distinguishes us between animals and humans. Not all of us have the capability to access that, sadly, so in terms of identifying how to do that, it's very, very important. But this is the freedom that we would have all probably heard about, whether it's Nelson Mandela who'd been locked up for many years, or people in the prisoner war camps in the Great War, World War II, and want to talk about the sense of humour that kept people alive. Again, I'd be delighted to talk about this after, but that residue of freedom was key to Franco. Not free from, but free to. There is no situation that does not contain within it the seed of a meaning. Not one, even to our last breath. In terms of faith in logotherapy, there were quite a lot of questions over the years, Frankl, in terms of the difference between or where logotherapy stood with regard to theology, with, the, with regard to religion and God. And Frankel felt in many ways that theology was more to do with the salvation or the, the saving of the soul, where he wanted logotherapy to be very much around the healing of the soul. So it was for the here and now. He wanted to heal people's souls today, while we were alive. He never really mentioned God much, even though his first book that he wrote on scraps of paper in Auschwitz was The Doctor and the Soul. But that's the closest he came to in terms of wanting to, let's say, box himself off in terms of where he stood with God. But Viktor Frankl was deeply religious. His psychology was called height psychology. And this, in many ways, I think, was to do with the comparison with Freud, whose psychoanalysis was really basement or ground in terms of Freud himself admitting that he dealt with people in the basement 
of their lives. And Frankel felt that the greatest respect he could pay to Freud was in terms of how a dwarf can see so much further on the shoulders of a giant. And Frankel felt that he really was on the shoulders of Freud, being able to take people from the basement up to the attic, which was in many ways open. But height psychology, I felt also, was a nice opportunity to talk about what he loved to do most. And he loved climbing. And his, his beloved mountains in Austria were, were very close to his heart. If we look closely, we'll see him appear. And he would, he would look forward to climbing. And unfortunately, when he was deported to, to, to many of the camps, and we'll come on to those shortly, but not for long, um, he missed his climbing most. That's what really, really caused him great distress. We're all familiar with the horror and the filth of the camps. I don't want to go into it today. It's not about today. In fact, Frankel and all of his work was not about that either. It was more about the fact that he had seen people survive the most atrocious conditions. But here's a man who was so deeply human. He said he saw saints on the German side and swines on the Jewish side. So how profound is that? But in terms of, and there's confusion over this, so I'd like to clear it up. He was the survivor of four camps. And that's an absolute fact. There instead, in the Czech Republic, Kaufery, which was a sub-camp of Dachau, Dachau itself and Auschwitz. They were the four. His father died in there instead. And Frankel, really in terms of Auschwitz, something happened that stuck with him for all of his life. When he arrived, he was told to strip off, so he got rid of his coat, which unfortunately had the beginnings of his book, The Doctrine of the Soul, stitched into the lining. But he was given another coat. And in that coat, and in the pocket of that coat, was a prayer. And that prayer stayed with him for all of his months in Auschwitz. But when he was liberated many years later, he was able to take with him all of the scraps of paper that he had written down for books, but that piece of paper disappeared. May from unimaginable suffering spring forth a growing awareness of life's unconditional meaningfulness. And at this point, I'd like to just read out something that I think you will enjoy, but really summarizes his experience in the camps. So if you bear with me, please, on this. Quote, it is true that if there was anything to uphold man in such an extreme situation as Auschwitz and Dachau, it was the awareness that life has meaning to be filled, albeit in the future. But meaning and purpose were only a necessary condition of survival, not a sufficient condition. Millions had to die in spite of their vision of meaning and purpose. Their belief could not save their lives, but it did enable them to meet death with their heads held high. <coughs> Victor Frankl saw many people choosing to put their shoulders back, holding their heads up straight when walking into the chamber. I therefore deemed it appropriate to pay tribute to them on the occasion of the inauguration of the Frankl Library and memorabilia at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California, Berkeley, California, where I presumed the custodian, where I present the custodian with a donation. A sample of soil and ashes. I had brought with me from Auschwitz. I said, it is to commemorate those who lived there as heroes and died there as martyrs. Uncounted examples of such heroism and martyrdom bear witness to the uniquely human potential to find and fulfill meaning, even in extremis and in ultimus, in an extreme life situation such as Auschwitz, and even in the face of one's death in a gas chamber. May from unimaginable suffering spring forth the growing awareness of life's unconditional meaningfulness. I think Frankel felt that 
because I bear witness to the unexpected extent to which man is and always remains capable of resisting and braving even the worst conditions. It is critical that people begin to understand freedom and responsibility. He saw many people robbing other people to survive, but he also saw many people giving away the last piece of bread or their pea from the watery soup. After liberation, he returned to Vienna, uh, number one Marianne Street, which where his office was as well. And he worked in the polyclinic for 20 years, 20 to 25 years. He also opened the Victor Frankl Institute, and that is where headquarters is today. Throughout his years, in terms of those two pillars, freedom and responsibility, Victor Frankl felt that the Statue of Liberty really should be complemented with a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. And he said, I recommend that the Statue of Liberty be supplemented by a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. That statue actually has already been crafted, but like many of these projects, seems to be on hold. But it does exist, two interlocking hands, full of support. So in terms of the 21st century and where we are today, in terms of his life's work, in terms of you being here today, in terms of me being here today as that instrument, I think there are some things for us to think about and they are just that, to be thought about, nothing more. These slides are available to anybody who wants them um, through Yvonne and the, the museum. So I put these questions together. Is there a threat to our freedom? in the 21st century, and what is our freedom to our country, to our nation, in terms of if we lose our soul, in terms of religion? Can we maintain moral life without the aid of religion? Are we fulfilling our will to meaning? Frankel crafted three pillars that came out of freedom and responsibility. And one was the freedom of will, the will to meaning, and the meaning of life. And each of those three, the will to meaning, was very significant in terms of, yes, we do, we are free to become who we ought to become. In terms of the will to meaning, it was our natural striving for meaning as our primary motivation, not money or power our primary motivation being our will to meaning. And when that gets frustrated, we end up with a neurogenic neurosis, which he felt was really the, the, spiritual, the spiritual challenges. So Frankl's whole theory and therapy of mental disorders dares to start in the human dimension, dares to start in the spiritual dimension. So would you believe it's a system that actually can begin in that dimension? Should the trend be not away from religion, but away from religions attacking and fighting each other? Fundamentalism. Hatred of each other and contempt for human rights. He felt that we must find our own individual way of talking to that supra being, whatever we choose it to be. Should the trend be towards creating or rediscovering a profoundly personalised religion with one's own language to address that ultimate being? And that concludes what I hope has not been too long, but a snapshot of a life from 1905 to 1997. So thank you very much indeed.